Should I be a solo real estate agent or should I join a team? And I want to talk about this in great depth and detail. So when I was thinking about this, there before we dive into like your guys' opinion, and maybe we can we can foster some some healthy debate because I don't know if all three of us see it, you know, exactly the same way, which would be really interesting to find out. But I want to tee this up by looking at five different uh, principles that I think people all can agree with when it comes to succeeding as a brand new real estate agent. And then we'll get into that conversation. So for me, number one at the top of the list is environment. And all the other four are going to fall into, you could you could categorize them into environment. But environment, what I mean by that is this. I was just thinking about this this morning in the shower, believe it or not. I know it's kind of weird, but this is what I think about. And I'm like, okay, what's the best analogy for environment? And, you know, we're, we are like creatures. We're like, we want to fit in. You know, humans just want to fit in with the herd. And I think about, I don't know if you guys have been to a play recently, but you know, at a play where it's super silent, you know, everyone's like, shh, don't say anything. And everybody's trying not to make a noise. But then after a skit, it only takes one person to start clapping and the whole place erupts yeah. and claps. Yeah. That's kind of what I mean by environment. Environment is like, how is an agent surrounded? And if they're surrounded with people that are fighting to be the best that they can, you got no chance or you have no other option but to fit in, right? So environment's very important. Number two is in it, inside of that environment that fosters, we'll call it prospecting. And I don't care the method necessarily, but it fosters an agent talk to new people on a daily basis every day, Monday through Friday. Not sometimes, not not most of the time, every day, because that's the job. Like if realtors were W-2 and they all got $180,000 salaries, that's what the job would look like. You'd come in with a suit and tie and you would be on the phone having conversations. Number three, skill development. So constantly working on what do I say? How do I say it? When I'm in front of a client, what am I presenting? What is this information I'm presenting? Do I know the market? Working on your skills. It's a it's a it's a professional's business. Number four, accountability. Are there people confronting you on the goals that you have set? Obviously, we're an industry of independent contractors, which is the cause of most of our problems. And then number five, <laughs> visibility, and specifically around measuring and tracking our behavior as it relates to what we do, what we don't do, and how that relates into our conversion ratios. So these are the five things that I think about to try to help an agent get clarity on what they should or should not do. Anything, would you guys add anything to that list before we jump into it? I mean, I, Brandon, I took some notes and, and this is something that I've been a husband and wife team since we started in the business. And it's something that my wife and I have talked about a lot over the years. And what I, what I wrote down were systems, processes, structure, and accountability. And I, and I think probably the things that you mentioned there all fit together with those things as well. But those are the things that I thought, you know, stood out as things that a new real estate agent needs to have in place, no, no matter where they get them from, right? Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Ben, do you have anything that you want to add to that list? No, I, I think it's I think it's solid. I have a lot of thoughts on those things, yeah. but yeah, it's a good all right, list. Well, all right, cool. So let's dive in. So, and yeah, you, you could probably split hairs and say, what about this and what about that? And, and the list would go on and on and on and on and on and on. The, I think where this conversation for me starts is like most things. And that is around money, you know, and we just had someone bring this up in our coaching community. And that's what prompted this conversation. And I don't know if you guys were on the coaching call yesterday, but someone else brought up um, hiring an assistant. That's and right. most of our Yeah, most of our industry. I hope that to, to change people's perspective, most of our industry yeah. looks at things on how do I do things that cost the least amount of money? 
the cheapest yeah. thing possible. And then there's no surprise why they are the same people where sellers are asking them to then discount their commission because we sell the way we buy. And mm. most people, when I'm talking to them, they're just looking for the cheap, 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 cheap. I want to outsource everything cheap, the lowest price, highest commission split. And for me, it's like, okay, well, what is it more about? This is the same thing I ask a for sale by owner. I ask a real estate agent in a leadership conversation. And that is this, what is more important to you? Your commission split or the amount of money you earn? Yeah. And so let's start with that. And what I mean by that is 100% of nothing is still nothing. Yeah. I, you know? I, I'm laughing, I'm smiling because I had that same kind of thought process coming into this conversation. So if I can rant a little bit Jump and then in. you, you kind of tag in, um, I think that two things, one, you got to remember that we are, correct me if I'm wrong, real estate is we're in sales, right? And I think a lot of times on a team or solo, people get the GCI confused with their net profit, That's right? right? And if we look at joining a team, it allows you to get a commission, but not have to worry about as much the, the things that come before your net. So all you're doing is netting versus here's my gross and now I'm going to spend money to net an amount to generate more business, et cetera. So kind of on your point, if you're unwilling to invest in growing the business and you just think that you get to keep everything that you make, that's, I think, a, a big disconnect versus. Well, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Versus joining a team somebody is doing that for you and in turn you keep less right but you didn't have to take any of the risk to do it and and your net is what it is versus being in control and dialing it in the way you want to does that, does that make sense am i getting that point across yeah but i think there's a massive assumption in in what you said and what you said, I agree with, but I think that the assumption is that one, you looked at both of those, Ben, with with a with a assumption that both of those agents in those scenarios were productive. I mm. think the conversation first has to start with, is there production? Under which of those um, environments is an agent more likely to, to sell houses because what you said maybe suggested that let's just say that and under both of those the agent sells 25 houses with a team sells 25 houses on their own that was the assumption i heard you you make my argument before we even get to the to that is which scenario for a brand new agent i'm talking about they just got their license on friday yep. right today's yep. tuesday under which of those are they more likely to sell the 25 houses? First and foremost, let's start right. there. And I think I think agents forget that they're in sales was kind of leading into it, right? That's where you got to start, right? For sure. Go ahead, Dom. Yeah. So um, it, it funny, Ben looked at it from that perspective. And my perspective is a little bit different. If, if I was an agent that got my license on Friday, or if I was talking to an agent that got their license on Friday, when they sit down at their brokerage, they hang their license someplace, they show up on day one. I mean, a new agent at, a, at the current brokerage model, they got no idea what to do. And the amount of time and energy that you spend trying to figure out what to do, who to talk to, when you finally do talk to somebody, what do you do with that person, the systems, the processes? To, to Brandon's point, uh, a brand new agent, they'll have a hell of a time selling 25 properties because of the amount of time and energy and resources that go into just trying to figure out what to do. I, you sit down with a team and they say, hey, Johnny, you call these 50 people today and I have a conversation. And any, everybody that says, well, yeah, I might be thinking about doing something, they go into slot A and they start mm -hmm. a process. And then you keep going like that. And all of a sudden you built a pipeline and a machine and, and, but the machine was already there. You just that's, had to plug right. into it. 
Yeah, and the thing, it, it would be easy for me to make a case for um, coaching, and I won't because on these conversations, I want them to be fully honest, fully transparent. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that a brand new real estate agent is ready for coaching. They, mm -hmm. they have to, cause here's, here's what we keep hearing about, you know, like, you know, sh again, should I join a team? Should I go solo? I'm at Keller Williams. I, I'm at EXP. I'm at Remax. W what should I be doing? Well, Again, I I don't look at nothing is is black or white. Everything's on a spectrum. So I look at things of what is more likely, what is less likely. And it is more likely that what Dominic just said is exactly what I see is that you walk into a brokerage and it is very very unlikely for that brokerage to be set up in a way for a brand new real estate agent to get the hands-on support systems, accountability, training. I mean, all the nuance. You know, yeah, they got classes on Monday morning at 9. I get it. And let's look at page 17 of the purchase contract. But there's, as you guys all know, the nuance that goes into being a real estate professional, putting aside even the sales piece of it, putting the side of who to call and lead generation and marketing and ever putting that aside, it's like, well, how do I log into, what is it called? The MLS? That's what I'm talking about. The nuance that goes into it, the thought of a brand new licensees being on their own on an island, which is what most brokerages are, to be fair. This isn't to pick on anybody. This is just the way the business is set up because brokerages, the business model, the, the profit margins are built on mass recruiting. Period. You have mm -hmm. to do that in order to make money as a broker. And they're not set up the same way a team is. And a team is set up the exact opposite. It's meant, it's designed to go deep, not wide. The brokerage is designed to go wide, not deep. And so I want to kind of get into the debate of like, well, why is that? Because agents say, well, if, I, if I'm a solo agent at Century 21, I could go on a 70-30 split. If I go mm -hmm. on Ben Ryle's team, I mean, this with, with a $25,000 cap, I go to Ben Ryle's, this dude's talking about 50-50, no cap. They're just looking at that split without any context. But yeah. then you look behind the curtain and you see that the average agent on Ben Ryle's team makes $197,000 within their first 18 months. And then you look at the agent who's on a 100% split at company X that sells four houses in their first year on average. It makes 20000 And so I go back to the original question. What is more important? Because this is such an ego-driven business, unfortunately. What your commission split, split says on some contract in some drawer or the money in your bank account? What do you guys That's think right. about that? Yeah. I Well, I, I think too... You know, I, I don't, I'm trying to think real quick on, on how to categorize this, but I'll make my point first is if you're going to start going to any other industry, let's, let's just use a, you're going to be a plumber and you've never been a plumber before. Do you walk in there and say, I don't know anything about plumbing. I'm going to start my own business to be a plumber. I've got to learn how to plumb. I've got to get leads. I got to do everything right the business side, the plumbing side, or are you going to go join somebody that already has a plumbing business, learn the trade first, and then think about going out on your own just because the risk is, is lower. And I think maybe that's the way we need to look at a team versus thinking that by joining this brokerage or that brokerage, it's, it's like a team versus joining an actual team and, and like you said, just focusing on what can my production be to get the most amount of reps as quick as possible to actually learn this business. Well, I think so, it's super dangerous. I think it's super dangerous for a real estate agent who gets in the business to even find out what I said. Here's what I just thought of when you were talking, Ben. So 
I'll give I'll give two examples, okay? This is what I think most what, it'll be interesting to see what people are saying in the comments. But here here's what I know. And I want your guys' experience. You guys are in different states. I'm in Michigan, right? I want to hear what you guys if if we were to go travel around the country and go into all the brokerages. We don't tell them we're coming. We just drive in. We go to Keller Williams, Century 21, Remax, Berkshire Hathaways. The list goes on and on and on. We go into all of them, right? What I think we would see is something that is super dangerous for a real estate sale, a new real estate agent to see, which is nothing. Hello? <laughs> is anyone here? Hello? That, that, that's what I see. Let me stick with that for a second. Is that what you guys see at these 27,000 square foot, you know, beautiful buildings? You walk in, there's a little cute receptionist maybe at the, at the desk, and then that's about it. Is that what you guys see in your states? 100%. Dominic? <laughs> That's the environment that I started prospecting in a big giant. I don't know what the square footage was a big bullpen of desks surrounded by offices for top producers. I'd sit out there on my own at 8 a.m. in the morning, just by myself in the computer, making my dial. Look at that weirdo yeah. out there. Prost, look at that guy. He's making phone calls. So after a year, the broker came and got me and said, hey, man, um, we're going to put you in an office. And it came to my attention that because all the top producers all around me didn't want to hear me making my calls at eight o'clock in the morning. So isn't that funny? Well, not only that, but no, lo and behold, we we can't have anybody uh, see this guy doing this. He's he's a weirdo. <laughs> Which was, goes back to my oh, point yeah. of environment. It is weird for an agent to be productive at a brokerage. It's weird. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, that was the only one ever. In the all the years I was at that brokerage, I won't name them, but I was the only one ever, ever that I knew. Me too. Calls. Yeah. Me too. But it wasn't until, you know, my name was at the top of every leaderboard every single month that everyone was like, wow, what's that weirdo doing? Maybe we should talk to that guy. So yeah. that, that's what we see. Ben, have I mean, it is, again, super rare. We're not talking about teams yet. We're talking about a brokerage for you to go in there. And the environment is thriving. You know, people are like, you just don't see that. On the contrary, you walk into a team office, and I don't care whose team it is, you will see the exact opposite. What you will see is music playing, people with headsets on their feet, prospecting, having conversations, throwing a football around, ringing the bell when appointments are being set. Sales trainings happening, hot seats happening, um, you know, uh, uh, awards being given to top producers. You know, that is what you will see. You will see a sales environment that is contagious. When you walk in, the energy is like, dang, that is so cool. That's what you see. And so going back to environment, you know, people want to fit in. And that's why I say it's super dangerous for a new real estate agent to walk into a brokerage, right, Dom? They want to fit in. Fitting in means don't prospect. Fitting in means be quiet. Fitting in means don't don't ruffle the feathers. Don't do a whole lot. Don't be super productive because then people are going to start to you know get mad at you. Hey, can you be quiet out there? I'm trying to play Tetris in here. You know, like <laughs> that's fitting in in a brokerage. Fitting in on a team is quite the opposite. It's a environment of winners, of people who are pushing each other, holding each other accountable, hearing every conversation you have or you don't have. You can't not show up. It's like, where the fuck's Bob at today? Bob, <laughs> get your ass in here, motherfucker. You know what I mean? That's what a team is. And so, I don't know. I could keep going on and on about that. But for me, it's pretty simple. It'd be hard for someone to debate uh, or, or, or convince me otherwise. Hmm. And that's how I started in the business. Both sides, both in my career in as an adult, I was lucky enough to start at a company, Quicken Loans, where that's what I knew. Yeah, it was a 100,000 square foot building, but it was filled with 10,000 people on the phone every single day with, with, with mini putt-putt, you know, thing and, 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 and nerf, nerf, nerf gun wars. We're chasing people, closing on the phone. It was me helping people close deals on a headset whiteboards tracking everything, you know, that's what I'm used to, you know, and then getting into real estate, I was lucky enough to join a team in the beginning 
that had that same culture. And then yeah. when I left the team, because there comes, we'll talk about that too in a second, when that time is right. And then to Dominic's point, I went on my own and I was like, wow, that's what it's, now I understand why people only sell three houses a year. It is a ghost <laughs> town. It's like a morgue. It's a morgue yeah. at most brokerages. Yeah, yeah, that was my experience. And I would, I would also add, uh, when I first got into real estate, my wife was working on a team and I would, I would uh, encourage you to, uh, a new agent to interview teams and find the type yeah. of environment that you are talking about, Brandon, because the team that my wife was on, she was just more like an employee, like an assistant. It wasn't that environment that you were talking about. And that's what ultimately led us to, I said, you know what, I'm going to do this on my own. But it wasn't until a year later that I found an environment like you're talking about, a real team where there's that action, the, the real deal, right? The bell going when appointments are set, everybody standing at rows of computers, a guy looking over your shoulder to see what you're doing. It was, you got to find that environment. 100%. And, you know, again, I don't want to broad brush anything or, you know, it's that it's not, I'm not saying every brokerage is like that. And I'm not saying every team is great. You have to interview people, you know, you yeah. have to meet with multiple different team leaders, multiple different brokerage owners. But I think that the scariest thing for brand new real estate agents is to a be in an environment like we're talking about or worse yet, this is even worse than that we haven't even touched on. This is what I always make my joke. I make myself laugh is putting them by themselves in their basement, in their underwear. Yeah. They got licensed Monday and then, yeah, just go by yourself. Oh, that's a good idea. That's mm. a great idea. Just, just put them by themselves and think that they're going to be productive. Yeah, right. Yeah. We're talking about humans. Yeah. It's not, I'm not picking on any individual myself is included a human being left on their own will always take the path of least resistance period and so the worst thing you can do is have bob go get licensed never been in the business before never been in sales before never owning a business no sales background and say yeah your first day you're gonna go um stay in your pajamas and then be in your basement that's what accountability that's what, that's what that's what you're creating yeah. Putting yourself in an environment to get that extreme accountability. Yeah. So let's talk about the, uh, you know, I guess we'll go back to to money because this whole thing came up like around splits. You know, it's always about yeah. split. What's the split? What's the split? What's the split? You know, and in the interview process, you know, I go back to one simple question that everybody always answers the same way. If you were on a 50-50 split and you made 280 or you could go on a 100% split, and make 20. I mean, what are we talking about? There's no debate. I mean, this is why great teams, not every team. I want to talk about the difference in, in, in just a second too. But if that was the reality, would you care what the split was? And so let's talk about what a good team is. Because yes, when we talk about a good team, we're talking about the per person productivity, the PPP. So what we look at in, in leadership conversations. And we're talking about a team where the PPP, the per person productivity, is way higher than the average. We're talking 20, 30, 35 deals per agent per year. And under that environment where they're, they have the environment dialed in, they have the accountability dialed in, they've got the training, the coaching dialed in, they have the systems dialed in. Most importantly, they have a client experience a uh, client service administrative team that is dialed in, which allows you then to focus on the revenue generating activities, which is talking to prospects and meeting with prospects, and the team handles the rest. Under those circumstances, who cares what the split is? But on the contrary, if a team means that Bob, the team leader, is buying Zillow leads and that is the value uh, 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 offer, that he's just giving his credit card, well, you could just give your credit card. If that's all that it is, not every team is amazing. It's probably right. quite the opposite. Most teams are probably dog shit, just like most brokerages, right? So if the value offer is I'm going to give you leads, and that means that Zillow's got your American Express number, that that there's no value there. Hmm. What's your guys' thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's different types of teams like you're talking about, right? There's the organic team of a top producer that just attracts people and they're just kind of there together. What what we're talking about is a team that's built out like a business. They've 100%. Got, they've got the inside salesperson. They've got the admin, right? They've got every, they've made the investments in the people, the leverage so that you can focus. And as a new person, there's so much to learn. And if you can focus just on the transaction, that's extremely valuable because that's what we need to learn and focus on. That's what's going to make you money. And I think a lot of times agents get into this business and they think I got to have this fancy website. I got to have a, a videographer team. I got to have this fancy TikTok stuff going on. And they lose sight of what actually makes them money. And the team really helps you focus on just that from day one and succeed on a, on a quicker timeline because you're not distracted, trying to build 10 bridges. You're just building one. Yeah, I think a lot of people that start teams start them from the wrong reason. They mm. believe, because, okay, so like, like commission split, then the next big low-hanging fruit with this team thing is leads. I need leads. I need leads. I need leads. I need leads. They're, they're, leads are leads are the easy part. Leads yes. are not hard to get. Anybody listening or watching the show, if you're gonna, if the allure of leads is what you believe is the thing that's keeping you from success, then you might get the you might get Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and you guys have heard me talk about that. You might just be the one who is taken advantage of by a team leader who is going to uh, lead you to believe, I got all the leads, and they do. But all they're doing is trading a credit card for 50% of yeah. your commission. You could give your credit card. Right. You know, leads are not the problem. And so to Ben's point, I think that when, let's get real practical here. So someone watching or listening to the show can have some takeaways. It's like, go and talk to somebody and find out it's not just about lead generation. It's about lead conversion. It is about culture. It's about environment. It's about leadership. It's about accountability. It's about visibility. It's about skills. It's about the operations. It's about the client experience. What happens afterwards? You know, it's the whole business. And those are the teams that people want to, A, go work at, B, stay at, and here's the key, key, key thing for anybody watching this. You will know if you're talking to a real, a team that has any real value, if this one thing happens. You guys ready for it? It's if they are the ones interviewing you and you not the one interviewing them. Meaning, mm -hmm. meaning they are, they don't hire every Tom, Dick, and Harry. Because here's the other thing that's also true. We talk about this all the time. You need to go and interview brokerages. Well, that's true because you will give them much more value than they give you. But if that is the opposite, where you're talking with an actual business owner who doesn't just take your pulse and say, uh, yeah, you're hired. You can start on Monday. But they're like, well, what are you going to bring to the table? Right? They put you through a series of, of interviews. There's a process in which they bring you into the business. That, to me, is the thing I would be looking for, that someone watching this, that you know you're dealing with a real professional that's just not needy to hire another body, you know, because mm -hmm. that's typically what brokerages do. Dominic, you have a thought on that specific point? Yeah, I, I mean, I would agree. And you hear people in the industry who are looking to be on a team talk about that very thing. Oh, hey, you know, the good teams aren't hiring right now. Well, yeah, that's because that's, they're being very selective about the who point. they take. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's what I would add to that is if you find yourself walking into, just like you said, I mean, I don't know if they go, yeah, you're hired, might not be the right place for you. That's a real, I didn't even think about that, Dominic. That's a good point. If you find yourself in a market and the top teams are not hiring, that you make it a point to prove to them why they should hire you. This is sales, right? And so that is the evidence or that's the thing that we're looking for. That's the sign. You walk in, you, you meet with the team leader, listen, thanks, but you know, no thanks, we're not interested or we're not hiring right now. 
that that be the one where you dig your heels in and say, listen, and you start to to sell, right? I get it. You know, what are the things? Can you tell me about the character traits of people that you're looking for? What are the things that I would have to do to set myself up to be a value add to the team, right? That's the whole idea. And so I think that the whole idea around, I mean, we could talk about this for hours and hours. I don't know how long we've been on, but the whole, the whole idea around what is the commission and then you make your decision on that, well, that's probably the worst way to make a business decision as a brand new agent. Because again, of everything we just talked about, there are, there are great places that you can find yourself that are, that are a 50-50 split or a 30-70 split or whatever the split is. There's great places where you might be able to keep a lot more of your commission, but that as a result, you don't have very much of it to keep. And mm-hmm. that, I think, is the key takeaway, uh, at least in my mind. I don't think that there is a broad brush that says this is the ultimate decision. You should do this. Other, uh, rather, these are the things I would consider. Uh, I have a question for you, for you guys, Brandon, Ben. If you were counseling a new agent who had made the decision to join a team, what questions should that agent be asking of that? team leader that's interviewing them beyond what what you just said as far as what kind of personality type they're looking for what else should they be asking the team leader to determine whether or not this is the right place for them to be great question one would be how do you what is your business model Hmm. understanding is it a is it an inbound lead business is an outbound lead business is it a business where they're just doing business off the team leaders past client centers of influence. That that would be something I would want to know. The second thing I'd want to know, and then Ben will get yours too. The second thing I want to know is um, how do you plan to help me develop my own skills? Yeah. You know, how, how, what does that plan look like? How do you guys develop the the talent on your team? What are your team standards? This is going to tell me a lot about the team culture and what I'm getting myself into. And if they say, Dominic, well, what what do you mean? Stan? We don't have any of those, <laughs> right? You know, we're looking for a team with strong beliefs. And here's the key thing that Simon Sinek says, right? It's in his book, Start With Why. Align yourself with a team that believes in what you believe. You make your life a lot easier. And then I would say, okay, well, those would be it. Character character traits of, of the people that succeed on your team. What does your business model look like? What is the plan to develop people that you have on, on the team? And then what are your team's belief system? What are the standards of your team? Ben, what would you what would be on your list of questions? Yeah, I I, I think you nailed a lot of them. I had down on mine. Um, I want to know the where the leads are coming from, right? And then, you know, that tells me conversion, timeline, things like that, right? Inbound, outbound, then your systems so that I know what type of leverage I have so that I know what I have to focus on. Am I solely focused on, you know, making sales and I'm a, I'm a salesperson or am I in my building? And then the last thing is just um, my career path based on other people. Is this, is there a ceiling? Is there opportunity for, for getting into the listing side? Cause a lot of times you start on the buy side on a team, you know, what does that look like? Is there room for that? Can you show me other people that have done that? Because I mean, that, that's what I want to know, right? Because a lot of times I think that, um, if you're getting leads at a high level, you're getting a lot of leverage, uh, a team can kind of be golden handcuffs, right? Because for you to leave, they have created just a bulletproof system that you're plugged into. So it's like, you you don't know that side of the business. So how much of the business am I gonna learn different pieces so that I can stay here and continue to grow? Or at some point, if I want more, am I gonna have to like leave to get that? And we have an understanding of, when that's appropriate and we're both okay with that. 
Yeah, up front. I think he, Dominic, he just mentioned something really, really important. Well, a cu- couple things, Ben. That was great. But one thing you said was, you know, what is my responsibility on this team? Like, meaning, am I just responsible for going out there and bringing business in? Or am I also responsible for getting it closed and looking mm-hmm. at that entire transaction? Because ideally, you'd like to start off, you know, with bite sizes, you know, like, okay, you're just going to, I love the way that um, some teams are doing it right now, where it's like, you start off as an ISA, like you're not going to, yeah. you're, all you're doing is generating leads and appointments over the phone. That's it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I love that. You're going to do that for the first six months of being a licensed real estate agent, because that's teaching you how to fish. That's mm-hmm. teaching you the disciplines, the mindset, the the skills. That's like the foundation. I love that piece, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And you said some other things too that that, um, are really important, which is like expectations up front. Because some people, again, there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's like, but some people would be better off just staying on the team for for their career. There's one guy in particular I'm thinking about. He does really well. He's on a really great team here in Detroit. And he's, he got in the business the exact same time that I did. And he's still on the same team that I started with. And he's doing extremely well, you know? And there's no reason for him to leave. Team gives yeah. him an assistant. Team does all his stuff. He doesn't have to bang his head against the wall managing a business. Because going off Correct. on your own means now you're not just a salesperson. Now you're a business owner. You're managing a P&L. You've got expenses. You've got all this stuff to consider where there is an argument to be had, Ben, of like, well, I just want to sell. Right. If I can make three, four hundred thousand dollars a year and just sell, yep. and I don't have to deal with clients, I don't have to deal with with you know this, that, and the other thing, and I don't have to. Deal I with can go on vacation. Either. I yeah. go on vacation. The team's going to handle my stuff. I mean, that's pretty. You know, I'm looking at your guys' faces like, whoa, wow, that doesn't sound too bad, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so that's the point, and that's what a lot of great teams provide people, and so. I think there's a lot of people out there that would never even have the need to go off on their mm-hmm. own if they find themselves on a good team. Mm-hmm. So so we talked a lot about, and tell me if this is not appropriate, but we talked a lot about teams and the advantages of being on a team. But we all three know that in our organization, in, in, in Listing Agent Academy, there are solo agents, new agents to the business that are crushing it on their own from their basement. How are they doing that, Brandon? What, how are the students, what makes them outliers like that? What kind of person is that? Yeah, no, that's a really, really good, good insight, Dominic. And and because I didn't, you're right. When this thing comes up, I I seem, I seem very one-sided. You know, I think that's abundantly clear that I'm probably biased on the side that a brand new agent probably starts with the team like i just feel that that is what is the puts that person in 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 the most likely uh chance to succeed however there's a lot of people that i think it's just person dependent but i go back that's why i started the episode the way i wanted or, or the way that i did is i think ben that's what you were alluding to if somebody starts on a team and they can learn the skills and they can learn they're, they're really an entrepreneur at heart and they and they can uh, learn all the foundation. It's perfect, perfectly reasonable. What happens most of the time is that person then leaves the team. Respectable. Mm-hmm. We're on the same page. No harm, no foul. And, and the reality is most people, the average I think right now that stay on a team is about 18 months. That's the life cycle. That is what a team leader should expect. And so that's one path. The other path is people don't ever even join a team. You don't have to join a team either. You can go right off on your own, assuming to to your question, Dominic, that they are in fact self-reliant, self-motivated, self-accountable. They can take responsibility for their actions. And this is a very rare breed of human, you know, where they can get up and put in the work every single day without having the threat of losing their job. And that's kind of like what, what a team will provide. You know, it's like, well, if you don't come here, you get fired. And that helps people get their rear ends in, into work. But you don't have to have that. So I think it really goes down to the, the individual person. And so 
I guess, on the other side of the spectrum, if somebody can get up every day, talk to new people, they can build a pipeline, they can build their skills by maybe investing in themselves, by getting into coaching for, for those rare, rare people, because coaching isn't for everybody, right? You've got to be able to be coachable. For those people, the other end of the spectrum is it would be hard for to debate that they shouldn't be on their own. That's the other end to be super fair, Dom. That like, yeah. well, why would that person be on a team? Because they don't need to give up half their money. And I think to, to put a bow on this, that's, I think, how this whole thing started. Ben, when you were talking about what you were talking about, assuming that it's that type of person, Dominic, then I think that person should go off on their own with the caveat that it's super rare to be that type of person. Because what I see is the solo person not prospecting every day, not following a yep. schedule, no discipline, no focus, not willing to be coached, not being coachable, and then sitting there saying, well, I don't want to give up half my commission to a team. It's like, you need to be on a team. So yeah. for the rare individual that can create all the things we talked about, well, there's 0% of me that thinks that person needs to be on a team because it doesn't make any sense. And I've, I've got one final thought. Yeah. Is I just shared this the other day with an agent. Instead of joining a team, if you're willing to do the type of work you just outlined, and you're simply joining a team because you've never done a deal before and you need help with a deal, why don't you call an agent like Dominic and say, hey, Dom, I'm brand new. I'm going to generate the lead. I'm going to get it under contract. Will you split it with me 50-50? Hold my hand until closing and walk through this transaction with me. That's true. Most agents will say yes, right? Yeah. And most agents, if they're a top producer like Dom or not, they can help you through that transaction. And you can do that for one, two, three, four, ten 10 transactions. And you decide when it ends versus having to like leave a, a team to be able to accomplish that side of the transaction. So it's like, I think if you're willing to, the other thing is invest in yourself up front. That's coaching. And a lot of times it's a smaller investment than making the investment of learning this stuff on the back end through a split, because that a Great lot of times point. adds up even more. So deciding who you are, what resources you have. Um, that's my final thought. Yeah. I, I it's really agree. Go ahead, Dom. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I've had, I was chuckling to myself because Ben said, you know, uh, a new agent, uh, get together with somebody like me. I've had agents over the years say, hey, man, can I shadow you? Can I shadow you? Like after one week of sitting there watching me make outbound calls for three hours, they're like, you know what? No, thanks. Yeah, no, oh, yeah. Thanks. me too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I think Ben brings up some really, really, really good yeah. alternatives, you know, where yeah. maybe you can get to the same point. Again, I think that I, I want to be very careful in saying without having to give up half your commission to a team, because sometimes that's exactly what people need. The vast majority, I would say, you know, we'll call it the 80, 20, 80% 80 of the people need that environment. They need the mm -hmm. job like experience in yes. real estate first before they go off on their own. But the 20% maybe can land at the same place with a couple alternatives. Get a mentor to your point. I'm going to first five, 10 transactions. A lot of brokerages do this. We split the deal so you can help me get through the transactions, navigate this thing so I don't screw it up. I think that should be mandatory, by the way. Uh, that's a whole other topic of raising the barrier to entry into this business. And then, or, or the other thing, it's, yeah, maybe you 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 invest fifteen or $20,000 in coaching in, to make two fifty dollars versus generating two fifty. dollars and giving up 125 to the team, right. if the coach can help you get to the same result for 20K, it probably makes a lot more sense financially if, if you are that 20% of person that can uh, be the self-starter.